coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I generally recommend that you want to sandwich your workout between a five to six hour intermeal window. So if you have a pre-workout meal, then you don't want to wait more than five to six hours before you have the post-workout meal. But if you, that means you have the pre-workout meal directly before the workout, then you have quite some time before you can have your post-workout meal. And for most people, you can just go home, take your time, shower, have a, a normal meal, solid meal, rather than have to slam down a protein shake, which was, of course, the marketing angle from the supplement companies that if you need it within, say, 15 minutes, then realistically, all you can do is slam down a protein shake. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed best-selling author, exercise and nutrition scientist, Menno Henselmans. We discussed, should you train in a fasted state? training frequency for muscle growth, can caffeine aid your workout, his optimal routine to enhance productivity, and his one tip to get your body back to what it once was. Really enjoyed my interview with Menno. I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin and special guest today is Menno Henselmans. Welcome to the show. My pleasure to be here. And Menno is an author, he's a physique, physique coach, um, also a scientist, an exercise and nutrition scientist. So glad to have you on here. Uh, I actually just recently, I was telling him I just got his book. So definitely check it out. There it is. The Science of Self-Control. And uh, I'm not through it all yet. Uh, I've only had it for about a week, but uh, 53 tips to stick to your diet, be more productive and excel in life. And those are three areas I always, I'm working on every day. And Mm -hmm. my question, my question for you was, uh, perhaps pick one, uh, one part of, of each area and what, which one would you pick, uh, regarding diet productivity and then excelling? (laughs) I'd say my main specialty is the diet part. And you'll see that section of the book is the the largest one. Mm -hmm. So, but the other ones are also very important. And as you said, you say that there are three areas you're working on. The reason I wrote this book is that I think these are all things that should be relevant for basically anyone. So I think yeah. I, that's why I was confident in going a little bit more mainstream because you can always go to the, the mainstream in the sense of things that everybody will benefit from. Right. How long did it take you to write the book? <laughs> in total? <laughs> five years or so. I mean, the actual writing was two or three years in terms of by the time I had it, had some work on paper and I was like, this is going to be a book. But if you count down the time from my notes, well, then it's like 10 or 11 years. But I guess, yeah, it depends on how you right. uh, count oh, yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I hear it. And, and what sort of, uh, before we go into more detail, what, what got you into um, you know, nutrition and, 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 you know, mastering physique and things like that. What, what sort of led you down that path? I'd always been into these things. I got more serious when with volleyball, we started doing some formal strength training mm-hmm. and I was also, yeah, I, I picked up on that very well. And I started doing strength training myself, going to the gym, but even as a kid, I was already doing, you know, workouts at home with dumbbells and mm-hmm. the, the not really effective stuff, but clearly the motivation was there. And then I just became more and more diligent and researched with it. Anything I do in life, I like to do well, typically. So for myself, I researched it a lot and I became quite knowledgeable. And the very first article I wrote and the certificate I got with the International Sports Science Association was more of a test for myself and the article more of an idea of, you know, (laughs) does what I think actually make any sense or am I just kind of playing here? And yeah, it, it... went from there things just grew people started asking me for coaching which is not really something that was planned i just started writing first right then and then it became a business and then people started asking me how do you get these kind of results how do you coach people so i went sort of a level up and i started my what's now my pt course which coaches 
which coaches coaches essentially mm-hmm. trains people how to become good coaches and yeah things just flew very organically for me for me because that it's something that had always had my passion yeah no i I would say I, I'm I'm the same way. It's just when you're passionate about something and it it's something and something that you want to do in your own life, it's easy to sort of help spread it to others, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, what would you say just regarding the book? I mean, there's a lot of tips. Were there a few tips that sort of stuck out in your mind, maybe regarding diet, that have just hold truth have hold truth for a long time? A lot of them. Yeah, I mean the value of consistency. Many of the tips are things that have been very long established, but people simply don't like to hear. They need to hear them, but they don't like to hear them. Yeah. You know, there's no magic in the book like, uh, oh, look, here, here are these super caloric foods, and this is the magic way to fit those into your diet, and the calories magically won't count. Right. It's about things that really work that are, I wouldn't call anything a hack, maybe the the MSG soup one is, is close to a hack, but anything that, that's in there is just, solid practical tips that have been proven both to work in, in the field or with my clients or with myself and in research. Gotcha. And, and I was also commenting on, on your Instagram page, uh, tons of great, definitely check that out. Um, because tons of great research you have on there regarding everything regarding muscle gain, fat loss. And, uh, I recently just had uh, Dr. Bill Campbell who had a similar type page and uh, one of the things that I wanted to touch on first, and I know you were on Dr. John Jaquish, his podcast. Uh, I've had him on a couple of times and you guys touched upon carbs and, and whether you need to do, you know, whether you need carbs for muscle growth and performance. And I'm just curious, uh, what are your thoughts around implementing carbs and, you know, whether it's right for some people and not others? I think the carbohydrate requirements that you typically see advocated for strength trainees are dramatically overblown and lack credulous evidence to support them, which is why we we worked on this paper. And it's the first systematic review, which in itself should tell you something, that I think the field, even the evidence-based field, has been a little dogmatic in accept, accepting the notion, coming mainly from endurance training, that strength trainees also need high carbohydrate intakes. But the fact that no systematic review had been done, there have been lots of reviews, but none of them have been systematic. So if you don't have a systematic review, you can essentially just pick the data as you like and build a case for, you know, you can, it's like an opinion piece to put it very bluntly. (laughs) And a systematic review is you have to weigh the pros and cons. You cannot exclude any studies. You have to create the a priori. You have to define what, what you're going to research, what the terms are. And then you have to dig through the entire literature and you have to discuss everything. And we found that there's actually not a single well-controlled isocaloric study that finds higher carbohydrates outperform lower carbohydrate intakes. None, not a single one. All of the research, which is not that much to begin with, that finds benefits of higher carbohydrate intakes, it's not calorie controlled. So it's, it just means more energy drives greater performance. And of course, that's a very different saying from saying you specifically need carbohydrates. And there have been multiple studies recently over the last few years that challenge the idea that it's even a physiological mechanism to begin with, that you eat something. One of the studies that I like the most is where they have people eat a placebo breakfast. So they give them certain gels and some people eat gels that have a lot of calories, like 500 calories or so. And some people have gels that are practically devoid of calories. Mm -hmm. And then you see that the people that eat breakfast compared to those that just drink water, They perform better, but there's no difference between the ones that eat the gels with or without calories, Mm. which goes to show, and then a recent study that followed up on that, going to show that it was the degree of appetite suppression that seems to have a positive effect. So a lot of these mechanisms, which is also a central theme of my book, are much more psychological than physiological. So people think they need carbs. There's this research to support this by by Job et al. and uh, Carol Dreck showing that when people think they need carbs, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when people always eat breakfast, they kind of need their breakfast to perform well because otherwise they'll be hungry. They they think they won't perform well. So there are a lot of these mechanisms in play that actually don't have much to do with the traditional theory of carbohydrates as a fuel source that you need 
to directly stimulate energy expenditure and perform movements. Very interesting. So would you advocate then like, for example, like we're working out in a facet state, um, let's just say resistance training. Mm-hmm. Is that, is that something that you would advocate or that, that you practice in your own life? No, I don't. I don't recommend it. In the book, we also uh, specifically advise against it because that's a case where you have only potential cons and no potential pros. So we recommend at least 15 gram net carbohydrates within one to two hours or within a few hours of the workout. And that's, I mean, that's very easy to, to do, you know, even on a ketogenic diet, you can do that. To a targeted ketogenic diet, you can still get 15 gram net carbs in. So I think that that's very doable for anyone. And there's basically no reason not to do it because if we, in our review, if we look specifically at the studies of fasted versus non-fasted, there is a trend that fasted is worse. Now, this might be because of psychological mechanisms, people not used to being, not used to training fasted, people right. being hungry, those kind of things. Nevertheless, th- there is a trend for, for evidence in favor of non-fasted training. And with protein intake, we also see this, which is, we don't have a lot of research on this, but we have a, a few studies showing trends for greater performance with protein intake pre-workout, uh, and also greater anabolism, greater direct muscle protein synthesis, mTOR signaling, and probably also reduced protein degradation. Because if you're training and you haven't consumed any protein, then you are you you have no substrate, so you can't build new muscle. The best case scenario is essentially if you're training your biceps fasted, that your body's going to break down your quads to build your biceps, and that's not really a positive either. Because the next workout you're going to train maybe your quads, and then it's breaking down your biceps to build your quads. So you, you need the protein and the workout period is one of the most uh, prime periods through the prime real estate in terms of timing for protein intake. So I, I see no reason to, to even risk that, even though I, I would agree that the research is not terribly strong, that you need to train right. with, with free workout feeding. And what about post? What about that anabolic window? I've heard it's like two days mm-hmm. long. It is. Yeah. So the anabolic window thing is, is interesting. I think history often develops in a pendulum-like fashion. So we swing from one direction to the other. Mm-hmm. And we really saw this with the anabolic window, where when I started, the idea of the anabolic window was kind of the supplement industry idea of like one to two hours post-workout. And Alan Aragon has coined this, the anabolic people theory, mm-hmm. which I like. And then it turns out that that's probably not really the case. I mean, you don't want to train fasted. But if you trained, if you ate pre-workout, you don't need to run to the locker room and slam down a protein shake to have immediate post-workout feeding. It's more of, I generally recommend that you want to sandwich your workout between a five to six hour inter-meal window. So if you have a pre-workout meal, then you don't want to wait more than five to six hours before you have the post-workout meal. But if you, that means you have the pre-workout meal directly before the workout, then you have quite some time before you can have your post-workout meal and for most people, you can just go home, take your time, shower, have a, a normal meal, solid meal, rather than have to slam down a protein shake, which was, of course, the marketing angle from the supplement companies that if you need it within, say, 15 minutes, then realistically, all you can do is slam down a protein shake. Okay. And uh, just for pre-workout, I know I know you, you brought a study up um, regarding like caffeine and how the effects of caffeine along with like these other pre-workout supplements had the same effect, mm-hmm. you know, with all these other, w- w- can you t- touch on that maybe briefly, if you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah, that was, it was funny. There was even a recent study that showed that pure anhydrous caffeine, so caffeine powder or capsules had a greater ergogenic effect. So greater performance enhancing effect than a popular pre-workout combo with like all the good stuff that you see. Right. Like advertised with, yeah, taurines, yeah. citrulline, uh, I think beta alanine was even in there mm-hmm. and like, yeah, all, all the, all the popular pre-workout ingredients basically together. And that was, I mean, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't put too much talk into that as being a negative, but it, it's certainly very solid evidence that these compounds don't aid your results. Like right. just caffeine probably is, is doing 95% of what you're doing. And the offers did raise some points about unknown negative interactions we tend to think, you know, if this works and this works, we put it together and then we have uh, even more benefits. 
but that's not necessarily how it works. We have some pretty compelling research at this point, although it's we're still in the infancy of really deciphering how it works, but there appear to be negative interactions between caffeine and creatine under short-term circumstances, hmm. in particular, the loading phase. And that's those are also things where most people would say, yeah, caffeine's great, creatine's great. Those are certainly one of the more established supplements, so those that work. And if you combine them, well, n- you don't necessarily get better results. One study found that if you combine creatine and caffeine, I think it was strength development or muscle growth. I'm tempted to say it was muscle growth, but the group that just had creatine had the best results. In fact, they were the only group that had significantly greater results, whereas the group that had caffeine and creatine, they didn't get significantly greater gains. So it would appear that the caffeine was actually a net, a significant net negative in that context when you combine it with creatine. So speaking of all this, why don't we build a little bit of a routine for a day? Um, mm-hmm. what, what would you say? And may, maybe, you know, maybe this is something that I'm sure you implement. What is your typical routine as far as, you know, do you have a, something pre-workout, eat a little something, then do you have a pre-workout? You know, sort of talk us through that. How, how does that work mm-hmm. for you? Well, there are a few angles to this. So right. yeah, in, in my book, I go through the, the angle of productivity as well, which are, for me is also very important. So I, I kind of blend these concepts here, but I think they work together very well. Because if you look at research, for example, you see that most world records and most high-level uh, performances by athletes are in the afternoon and early evening. And research also suggests that core body temperature is highest at that point. And there is some research showing that you may also get better gains if you consistently train in that time. But if you're very consistent, you can probably make similar gains in the mornings, mm-hmm. especially if you also use caffeine strategically only in the mornings pre-workout. And in turn, most professors and writers report that they do their highest quality work in the mornings. And this, this is dependent on sleeping well, of course, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> because there are a lot of people that, you know, they, they wake up and they, it takes them hours to get going, but that's a problem with your biorhythm and your sleep. And I can say from experience, because I was, exa- I was exactly there. I had massive problems with sleep in college, mm. um, even mild insomnia. So or how, how did you help? How did you help get that better? Meticulous biorhythm control. So I still use melatonin every day, three to five milligrams. If I don't get adequate sunlight exposure, I use a full spectrum daylight lamp with 10,000 lux to mimic the sun, essentially. has been shown to elevate um, your mood and subjective well-being. And also it, it, it essentially does what sunlight does in that it prime sure biorhythm to tell your body, okay, now it's time to, to be alert, to be active. Just like if you, if you don't have that effect, then at night you don't get the effect where your body says, okay, now it's nighttime. So we're going to get sleepy. And one of the big things that happens then is that the body produces melatonin. Uh, my body though produces not enough melatonin or too late, which is why I benefit a lot from supplementation uh, and consistent times of everything. So your body can adapt to almost anything. It's not like many people will say there's sort of an ideal schedule and there is an ideal schedule, but you can kind of switch that schedule around as long as you do everything consistently, Mm -hmm. then your ideal schedule can be quite flexible. But there are a few components such as not training fasted, uh, probably training later in the day, uh, if if possible. Otherwise you want to use caffeine pre-workout and only pre-workout and always train in the mornings. And then in the mornings, you do your most intellectual, creative work. And then you want to do things like meetings and calls. You want to do those later because the auditory cortex is more resistant to fatigue than uh, the visual cortex. So most things like, and in general, social interaction is inherently quite arousing. So we can, you can always do, um, you know, a, a business meeting, especially if it's not one where you have to do something very um very difficult, or if you just have to listen, you, you can pretty much always still do that at the end of the day. And if you do it in the morning, I've certainly found that it, it wrecks havoc on the rest of your day. If you start the day with, say, an interview and two meetings, then you're mentally very tired and it impacts your the rest of the day a lot. Whereas if you do those things at the end of the day, then your quality during them is going to be very similar. But the rest of the day, the quality of your work is going to be a lot higher. Mm-hmm. 
So there's um, also a, a difference in what kind of work I plan at different times. And then based on that, you want to have your meals at relatively consistent times. And again, sandwiching the workout between a five to six hour intermeal interval. And then remaining days you can spread across the day. Intermittent fasting can work. I'm not a big fan of fast of more than say 16 hours, but uh, in general, it's, it's very viable, especially when cutting, when trying to lose fat mm -hmm. and for certain individuals. Um, so would you, those are the key principles. Yeah, those are all great principles. And I, I, I try to abide. I, I feel like I abide by a lot of them. I try to do all my like, you know, like important work tax, tax, like tasking things in the morning mm -hmm. when, and I do find as the day goes on, it's like, I try to just put all the stuff that maybe I don't need to concentrate as much on towards the end of the day. And you are right. Like an interview like this, we could do this in the afternoon. It would be just as good as probably in the mm -hmm. morning. Um, as opposed to if I tried to write a book, <laughs> I'm probably right. better off doing that in the morning and not waiting till eight o'clock at night uh, to do that. And then as far as workouts, like for example, like I usually do my strength training sessions, like let's just say around one o'clock. So mm -hmm. not like first, I used to be first thing in the morning. I don't anymore. I do enjoy the midday workout. Um, if I was going to have a pre something, <laughs> uh, what would you recommend as far as food? Um, and how many hours do you think you need to give yourself before you then go into do, do the workout? Yeah. Is it your first meal of the day or your second? Yeah, it would be my first. Yeah. If it's your first, I would ideally have at least an hour between the meal and the workout. Right. I think most people intuitively also prefer that. And then in terms of what you eat, it doesn't matter so much. I mean, if you, you have like a really fatty high fiber meal, maybe you want to wait more than an hour, 90 minutes, two hours, because you want peak hyperamino acidemia to occur with the workout. And basically, you want your amino acid levels that you get from your food, from your protein sources, you want those to be elevated in the blood by the time you're doing your workout so that the body registers that the substrate is available for anabolism. And there's a, an enzyme called mTOR. It integrates the signals for anabolism, for muscle growth, and one key signal is hyperamino acidemia. And the other signal is, of course, the mechanical tension on the muscle fibers and the, the, what you create with the workout. So when you have both those si signals at the same time optimized, you should get maximum muscle protein synthesis and long-term muscle growth. So one to two hours, you'd say. And as far as what you're eating, you probably don't want to go crazy. Maybe some eggs, eggs and, you know, something. Yeah, it doesn't even ma it doesn't matter so much. I think... You don't really have to think of it as a pre-workout meal, just a meal. Okay. Okay. Right. So what you would normally do. Uh, okay. And then, and then, you know, let's say you do that, then you work out, maybe then your next meal, you could wait maybe th three, four hours till your next meal. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in terms of macronutrients, like I said, you do want the pre-workout meal to have at least 15 gram carbs, but you know, it should be, uh, Pretty, not not very not very like, difficult. What what is that? An apple? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're pretty much there. <laughs> yeah. And at least 0.3 and probably at least 0.4 gram per kilogram protein. So like 20 gram high quality protein is a good rule of thumb. At a minimum, you can go higher, much higher if you want. But that that seems to be the minimum to stimulate a robust uh, muscle protein synthesis event. Gotcha. Now, is that your typical routine? Would you would you when do you typically work out in the afternoon? So today, for example, <clears throat> I had my breakfast a little earlier than normal. Normally it's more like maybe 10, but uh, this morning I had a call at 10, which couldn't be moved to another time. So at, at about nine, I had breakfast. And then at about two, I had uh, meal two. Breakfast was a big ball of Greek yogurt with uh, raspberries and sweetener. And then... At two, I had a big plate of um, whole grain spaghetti with pesto sauce and chicken and an olive oil. And then I worked out before this. This call started for me at five. And I have a call. And after this, I'm going to, I think we're going to go for sushi. Okay. But maybe well, we you mentioned home. that in your book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a big sushi fan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you typically do three meals and then you'll fit your workout in between, between the meals. 
Mm-hmm. And um, what about as far as I do you typically like to, to, to stay like, what's your carb count like macronutrient look like? At the moment, I'm, uh, I'm kind of winging it, like main, main gaining. My carb count's probably, I'm at least 20% fat intake. I think I'm at 30, about 30% of my energy intake is fat. And then protein intake is about 200 grams and the remainder is carbs. And I'm at 3,700 calories. Okay. So you're getting 200 so, grams of carbs. Do you typically do yeah, for sure. one gram per body weight? No, I don't, I don't actually count the carbs. Like I don't even know. Oh, the pro- I'm sorry. I meant, to, I meant to say protein. Yeah. It's, I mean, I'm getting, uh, I'm following my, uh, the general recommendation of at least 1.8 gram per kilogram or 0.82 grams per pound of total body weight per day. And I'm, I'm a good 200 pounds. And then I, I typically go over that and I end up about 200 or so. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Just, I, I like hearing about routines. So just curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, what would you say? I, I looked at a few of your different studies uh, that you posted um, as far as volume is concerned. I know you talk about it with, you've talked on other podcasts. What is, what is good training volume uh, optimally for muscle growth? What would you say? It depends a lot on the individual. Volume okay. is like energy balance. Energy balance is the di- on the diet side and volume on the training side. These are like the, the big two sort of scale uh, or balances that you want to optimize for a given individual, depending on their goals, mm-hmm. because volume will depend on someone's stress level and uh, sleep, how much they can recover. In general, all recovery factors impact volume tolerance, whether they're bulking or cutting, if they are an untrained individual or advanced. Now, typically for a trained individual with somewhat normal life circumstances, the volume is going to be in the range of like 10 to 30 sets per week per muscle group. And then I have some outliers, like uh, one famous example is I coached uh, IFBB pro uh, woman, Nina Ross, and her volume, I think was 48 sets. Wow. I think we were at for the glutes, like she trained twice a day. Uh, she had just everything, everything going well. She has good genetics, good, good everything, perfect dedication, everything perfect. So, and then also typical female high work capacity and everything. So it was just, we pumped in more volume, more volume results Mm. got better, better, better. So, uh, and she's natural by the way. So that's a pretty crazy example. Right. But then on the other hand, I have some hard gainers that just get crushed by anything more than even 15 sets per week per muscle group or so. Okay. Got it. So it really depends on the individual and just figuring out what works. So you'd probably say four weekly training sessions for the average individual, four to five. Yeah. If you, I mean, if you want to do it in two and you want optimal results, I don't think that's possible. In three, you can get optimal results, but they're going to be very badass workouts. Okay. With four, for sure, you can uh, get optimal results. And what's your thoughts? I, I know you're going back to Dr. John Jake, which because I talk about the X3 uh, quite a bit on air with, with rever- variable resistance. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if that's something you guys touched on and, um, you know, he's a big proponent of doing, you know, like one set to fatigue and you're starting to see that more and more. I don't know if you guys discussed that or do you have any thoughts Mm -hmm. around variable resistance and, and, and the X3? Yeah. I mean, I'm a big proponent of variable resistance, but combined with other resistance, I think just band training typically doesn't net a very good, uh, resistance curve. So what you want from the resistance curve is that it aligns somewhat with your strength curve so that you can get high levels of mechanical tension throughout the set. So if you're doing a a band press, for example, then you get very high resistance at the top of the press and basically no resistance in a stretch position. So, you know, in in, in this position when your, your elbows are back. Now, if anything, you want it to be the other way around because it's the stretch position where you can stimulate stretch mediated hypertrophy and research has found that the stretch position is, is the most important part of the movement because you stimulate not just active mechanical tension, but also passive tension. And your strength level is quite high from the midpoint on or so. So the sticking point is kind of in the opposite direction. Now, if you do a barbell bench press, sticking point is usually a few inches off the chest. So then adding a band can be a great way to overload the top part, which otherwise remains understimulated. So then you get a very good compromise between the two. But just bands, I would even say that often, like during COVID, I had a lot of my clients that just had 
bodyweight workouts. And a lot of people ask me, what do I buy? And typically they would, I, I would tell them, you know, rings, bodyweight workout stuff. If you can get barbell dumbbells, that's of course great. But otherwise we will mainly do, we'll mainly work with bodyweight type exercises because just bands, uh, I don't think you're going to get great results. They're almost isometric contractions, you know, in many cases. Gotcha. I wonder, did you guys talk about that with him or no? Not really. No. <laughs> I think we have different views on, on uh, quite I'm some bad. topics. The, the main convergence we have is on, on carbs. On carbs. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say I've been using the X3 and, along with some dumbbells, uh, mixing it up here and there. And it, it, I will say it is a little bit easier on the joints, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about the sticking point where you're at. You're almost like your, I would say your weakest, right? Where you're talking where you got the dumbbell close to the to the chest, um, it's a little bit easier when you're in variable resistance in the in the bands. And as you're pushing, obviously you're getting stronger because mm -hmm. your arms are extending. And so I did find it was a little bit easier on the joints from that perspective. And, yeah, and there was research yeah. to back that up as well. That yeah. people benching with either chains or bands, they experience less shoulder pain than people just just bench with a barbell. Right. Okay. And. Uh, what would you say some of the, your favorite supplements for muscle growth are? I know you talked about creatine. Um, so like, a, let's just say a post-workout, obviously I'm assuming whey, some type of whey and, 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 and creatine. Is there anything else that, that you like for muscle growth? I actually wouldn't even recommend whey. Okay. I think whey, I just go with whole foods. They're more satiating. And there's actually research to show that if you rely on whey a lot, you may need to either have a very high protein intake or meal frequency because whey is absorbed too fast to sustain postprandial anabolism. Interesting. So the supplement companies always advocate whey is like the best because it's the fastest, but fast absorption and digestion speed is actually not a benefit in many practical contests, contexts because your body can only have a certain level of muscle protein synthesis. At that point, your muscles reach what's called the muscle full effect and uh, it peaks. So you can elevate hyperamino acidemia to greater and greater levels, but you won't get greater muscle protein synthesis. Uh, that's muscle, the muscle is full, if you will. And with whey, you're, you're gonna hit that point very quickly, but then the protein is gonna come in very quickly still, which means your body has an excess of amino acids. And what does the body do with an excess of amino acid? It oxidizes them. And that's not what you want as the metabolic fate of your protein. You want it to be used for muscle protein synthesis. So when you look at studies that compare whey versus uh, casein, for example, then the supplement companies will tell you, look, you have all these studies here that show whey beats casein, but they're all the short-term studies. If you look at the studies that are six hours or longer, casein actually wins. It's at least equal. And in, I think, one or two studies or even more, I'm pretty sure it's at least two I can recall, casein wins in terms of protein balance. And in at least one study, I think, muscle growth longitudinally. So that's, yeah, there's absolutely no benefit of whey versus beef or dairy or eggs, poultry, any high quality protein source. And those are all uh, also have the benefit of having more nutrients and satiating you more. So I wouldn't even recommend whey. Whey is more like, um, if you can't get a whole food or something in, then, you know, whey is okay. But even then, I would say, is, it, is that really the problem? I think often behavioral change is the problem. Just like people say, like, I can't eat pre-workout. And I say, okay, that's nonsense. Problem one is that you think that, that that's true. Because it's, objectively, it is not. It takes absolutely no time. It, it takes five seconds to pull out some smoked poultry from the fridge or to get some Greek yogurt or something. Making a protein shake is more work than eating a, some canned tuna. You know, it, like it really is. You have to make the shake, right. shake it, uh, <laughs> clean it. Uh, canned tuna is, is literally faster. So th that is not the, the physical issue. So, yeah, I'm sure the the, comp the the way companies will like to hear that. So, but 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 I would agree. I think ha anytime you can have a some type of whole food source, you're best you're best off. I think a lot of it's just a marketing campaign for a lot of these companies. What about your thoughts around essential amino acids? Because there's a lot of those companies, um, you know, regarding like getting, you know, the correct amount of leucine and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, supplement companies are very inventive in how they take a product and they make it worse and they sell it for more. So you have, 
you, nature gave you a package deal with protein sources. They right. give you the essential amino acids, the non-essential ones, the branched chain amino acids. All the amino acids are in there. That's, that's literally what defines a high quality protein source, that it has a complete protein uh, profile of all the amino acids and also in proportions that correspond to human needs, roughly. That's a defining feature of what defines protein quality. So when you take away some of these amino acids, then you find you get worse results, just essential amino acids. They actually don't give you the same results as also including the non-essential ones because it's still substrate for muscle building. It's still protein that your body wants to use. The, the fact that your body can create it doesn't mean that it always will because it's, it's still more, it's easier still for the body to get it from your diet than to produce it itself. Cholesterol, for example, is a compound that's from food in some research has been shown to increase muscle protein synthesis. And in some research also correlates with muscle growth. But your body can produce cholesterol itself. But that doesn't mean it will to the proportion that is optimal for muscle growth. So in, in almost all of these cases, the research is very, very clear that uh, it just gets worse. Like if you take a whole protein source and then you split it into whey and casein, it already gets a little worse because as we just discussed, whey has some limitations. Mm -hmm. And then if you take away from the whey the non-essential amino acids, you just have the essential amino acids, it gets worse still. And if you hydrolyze it, there's also some research suggesting it, it gets worse. And then if you just take away the, just get the BCAs, it's worse again. <laughs> and then just the leucine and it's still worse. And then, well, you can metabolize it even further and then you get HMB, which is mostly bunk probably. So, but yeah, of course, um, the, they'll be happy to sell it to you. Right. <laughs> and what, what, what would you say would be one of your favorite post-workout meals just any meal, pretty much. Any meal, okay. Yeah. So like Cre creatine uh, works. I mean, creatine is, is as good as it gets, which is not very impressive, but just simple creatine monohydrates, three to five grams per day. I prefer to, with a loading phase beforehand of 15 to 20 grams for five days. And you should, if you're a responder, you'll, you'll see some benefits from that, increase in body weight, increase in work capacity, and a minor increase in long-term gains, now, along with some health benefits potentially. Would you say, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Would you say for creatine, that's something that is probably the only thing, maybe if you're going to supplement with something, that would be it. Sounds like, uh, yeah, just for, because you can't get as like, how much do you get from a steak as opposed to, you know? Yeah, not much. I mean, right. there is creatine in steak, but it's not so much that you're going to saturate your muscle creatine source, which is also what determines if you're a responder. Some people are naturally quite saturated and maybe just eating meats is enough mm -hmm. and other people not nearly. So yeah, creatine is something I generally recommend, but many people are unimpressed with it and they stop taking it. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And if you're not impressed with creatine, you're not going to be impressed with anything else that's legal <laughs> and safe. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And uh, okay, this was good. Yeah. Um, what, what would you say regarding, and going back to, I, I saw one of your posts regarding unfiltered coffee. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my wife, like, for example, like Starbucks everywhere, right? I'm assuming their coffee is probably not the greatest quality. Um, is this something that, you know, you, you work with your clients on, like getting some type of filtration or buying a quality or, you know, organic, you know, bean? Yeah, I recommend filtered coffee. You want the paper filter to get the uh, di diterpenes. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And... If you don't, research finds that recent meta-analysis confirmed this, you get a substantial increase in cholesterol because these, these diterpenes, they raise the bad LDL cholesterol levels uh, quite substantially. The effect is, is larger than that of most other food categories, which is you know, very significant for something that doesn't even have um, macronutrient value. Right. So yeah, Starbucks is, is usually not filtered. And I think most of the commercially available coffee is not filtered. It's not filtered. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's a pop, it's such a popular drink. And, uh, I think it's probably just almost over consumed and, and relied on upon a lot of people. <laughs> is Caffeine is widely yeah. regarded as the most abused drug on the planet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I try to use it strategically. Like you were talking about as almost like a pre-workout. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it works. Funny enough, though, um, it does not work as well as anhydrous caffeine. As what? Uh, I'm sorry. As uh, caffeine powder or pills. So anhydrous caffeine uh, that has not been dissolved. Okay. Research, there have been a few studies showing that it works better when it's anhydrous caffeine compared to when it's in coffee or dissolved. Hmm. And it's unclear why. It doesn't appear to be a factor of the absorption or anything. But just like the recent study showing that the anhydrous caffeine performed better than the pre-workout, it is probably due to a similar mechanism. So yeah, I typically I recommend when possible anhydrous, but I mean, the effects of caffeine are mostly psychological. It's mostly just a psychological kick up the butt to make you train yes. harder. Yeah. Like it, it really doesn't do much physically, if anything, especially not in dosages that you can take. I mean, research says it'll look at increases strength and everything. And then usually you're talking about dosage of six milligram per kilogram. Mm -hmm. That's like six Red Bulls for the average guy. So unless you're going to, you know, slam that down every pre-workout, then any benefits you get are most likely, mostly, if not exclusively, psychological. Uh, and that, with that in mind, you know, if you like coffee more, by all means. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious, you talk a little bit about like comfort eating. And I think that's something that a lot of people do. How do you, how do you work with clients? Or I know you mentioned maybe even in the book a little bit, how you get around mm -hmm. people who struggle with comfort eating. Yeah, comfort eating is extremely common and very misunderstood. And I think the most important thing to note with comfort eating and what people should learn when they experience it is that it, it doesn't work. It's not effective. So the idea is that you, you feel bad. And this is also something you have to realize the, the cause is that you, you feel bad, you're stressed or you're unhappy or depressed or anxious. And that causes your brain to seek for forms of instant gratification. And food is one such thing. And if you put people uh, in scanners that look at your brain activity, you can see that they become more sensitive to signs of instant reward, such as a dollar sign. And in that state, you, you really want to know that the cause is not uh, physical. It, it's unhappiness or just not feeling great, emotional discomfort. That, that is the cause of the problem. And the solution is, again, not really something physical. It's not like and this is what people tell themselves, which makes it a lot worse. And it's, I think, fed by many media and people that say your body is sort of, you know, searching for that food or it needs the carbs. Oh, it's usually carbs. That's it's, um, in these cases. And people try to rationalize. And that makes it so much worse. If you instead realize, look, you're just unhappy and you need to find a way to make you happier. And food is one such way, but it's a very, very ineffective way. I mean, the, the effect of eating on your happiness is super transient. It's not major. Uh, it, and it's, it doesn't solve any of the problems that made you unhappier. Mm -hmm. So much often, and the problem is, of course, it comes with calories. And if it's not good food, maybe health implications, et cetera. So what you can also do is just watch an episode of a, your favorite comedy series or have a talk with a friend or better yet with stress. If you can solve the actual problem, that's, of course, Greatly preferred active coping instead of passive coping works a lot better in research. And, and you know, it doesn't have to be a, a nutritional thing. Yeah. That is, I think, the most important thing to, to realize. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. And um, a few more questions and we'll wrap it up. I, I noticed on, on, uh, on your Instagram handle, you talk about like a healthy body fat percentage. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I have a lot of my clients do DEXA scans and Obviously, I'm assuming it depends on height and things like that. But what would you say a healthy body fat percentage? Uh, what did you come across? So it's low. You have to be lean, like not overweight for sure. And then it's mainly a question, especially in men. Uh, your audience is mostly men, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'll focus on men. I'll give in a note for any women listening. But <laughs> for women, typically at 10%, it's going to be a bit similar. But women are more tolerant to higher body fat levels. But that's, yeah, that's, that's roughly a oh, decent. Add, you said add, temp, add, add 10%. Gotcha. Yeah, add 10%. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, for guys, it's at least until 15%, the lower the better. Now, when you go below 15%, then it gets a little more complex because there's not as much research and below about 10%, you get divergent results. So the health benefits of fat loss exist at every level. When I 
uh, had some tropical virus infection or allergy thing in Brazil during my prep. I went to the hospital, they did every possible scan on me imaginable, couldn't find out what was wrong, but they, in the process, at least they looked at all my other markers mm-hmm. and my heart rate while I was on caffeine was 30. Was what? 30. My heart rate was 30. Wow. One beat per two seconds. So I basically had the heart rate of an ultra professional high level endurance athlete, which, which is a good thing. Yeah. And my blood pressure was like not low, but like su- super low for, for a muscular strength training. And uh, all, all measures, insulin sensitivity was through the roof. Like, you know, that pretty much like on the, on the top end of the scale. And all, all measures pretty much were, were super good. And it's because fat loss improves all of these markers. Blood pressure, not so consistently, but pretty much any other measure of cardiovascular health, cholesterol levels, um, inflammation markers, insulin sensitivity, they all improve with fat loss. And the leaner you get, the better they get. So the health benefits of fat loss are pretty significant. Yeah. Only at a certain level, they become offset by potentially suppression of the immune system. And this is below 10%, typically. Then you get, okay, you still get those benefits, but you're kind of maxing, you're kind of maxing out systems that are already probably very healthy. On the other hand, you're going to have decreases in your anabolic hormone levels. Now, it's contentious to how much that actually hurts your health. And I think you're going to reach a point earlier where you're hurting your vitality, not so much your health, mm-hmm. which means your, your well-being, your energy level, and after that, probably also your health. Well, then your, your libido, those things, they're, they're going to tank earlier. But pure physical health in terms of longevity, it, it might actually still improve. At least until, you know, at some point it certainly uh, tanks because, you know, we have an essential body fat level. If you uh, diet below that, you can you literally die of starvation. So that clearly is not healthy. Sure. But I think most people underestimate how largely the health benefits of fat loss are. It's, it's well known that calorie restriction is the most promising way to extend human life that we currently have available. And that calorie restriction and fat loss are essentially one of the same thing, you know? So would you say that, so when you talk about calorie restriction and let's say you have a client, is this something that like, if they're, you know, let's say their baseline is 2,500 calories, are you keeping them in just a little bit of a, a like, um, like 2,200 or 2,300 over a period of time and, 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 or just is it like a self-experimentation on, on as far as how much, how many calories would work? Yeah, you want to estimate their uh, total daily energy expenditure, and then you want to set their look at the, what their obde- ideal energy balance is. So, say maybe it's a twenty percent deficit or a thirty percent deficit. Well, then you subtract thirty percent from the total expenditure, mm-hmm. and then you need to monitor their progression over time. They should lose fat, otherwise something's uh, wrong, probably. But over time, their metabolism will adjust. Via various mechanisms. So for one, they're, they're eating less. They're gonna if they're reducing their body weight, that's reducing their energy expenditure. And then something called adaptive thermogenesis occurs. Basically, the nervous system becomes more efficient with how with energy expenditure. And typically, that manifests itself also as a decrease in what's called NEAT or SPA, spontaneous physical activity or non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So basically, your just activity level that you're not really aware of, bobbing your head, nodding. Um, uh, walking when you think, shifting around to your sheet, those kind of things, you start doing less of those when you get really lean and that decreases your energy expenditure. So you may have to adjust your markers. On the other hand, if you gain a lot of muscle, for example, it may actually be that your metabolism speeds up. Right. And that would probably be the key, right? If you're doing a little bit of restricted calories to keep, keep the muscle up, obviously get the fat loss down and Mm-hmm. ways to do that obviously resistance training and and keeping protein at a good level yeah and anything that builds muscle also works to preserve muscle so nutrient timing the things we talked about earlier um not training faster nutrient timing considerations sleep stress everything yeah that also impacts uh muscle growth gotcha okay and then tr- do you ever do days on rest days where you're in in more of a, uh, catabolic state, would you do, I know you talk about some fasting, do you do some fasting in off days and stuff? And then maybe mm-hmm. on days when, you know, you're training, you 
you increase calories? Yeah, I like calorie cycling for more advanced clients at least. And there, there are a few studies to support that if you move nutrients from the pre to the post-workout period, meaning like the first part of the day to later in the day after the workout, not necessarily literally before to literally after the workout directly. Uh, it improves nutrient partitioning, which is the ratio of muscle to fat that you gain or lose. So if you have good nutrient partitioning and you diet, then you lose fat and not muscle. Maybe you even gain some. Whereas if you have poor nutrient partitioning, if you're an energy deficit, you lose mostly muscle mass, which is of course not desirable for basically anyone. So you, you can potentially improve nutrient partitioning with calorie cycling and moving more of your nutrients towards your anabolic windows. Now, as we discussed, those are not one or two hours. Those are uh, potentially even a day or sometimes multiple days in a beginner, in which case if you're training four times a week, you probably don't have to bother with nutrient timing because your anabolic window is going to be pretty much on mm -hmm. for the whole week. But for more advanced trainees, that's probably not the case anymore. And then it can benefit you to, if you have, for example, you don't train in the weekends, you train during the work week, but not in the weekends, then you can have lower calorie uh, calories in the weekends, for example. So you have to figure out if that is practical for you, but right. uh, that would be physically a good way to go about it. Okay. And uh, last question, I typically asked all my guests is, what would you say if you were going to give one tip to an individual who was maybe a middle-aged male who was looking to get their body back to what it once was, maybe when they're in their twenties and thirties, what one tip would you give them? <laughs> well, I think the, the biggest tip would be that you want to start, stop seeing yourself as a middle-aged male, because mm -hmm. if you look at the research, middle-aged really has no bearing on your capacity to build muscle and lose fat. Your energy expenditure may be slightly decreased, but that's mostly if you've been sedentary and you've just, you become deconditioned, you've let yourself go a bit. Mm. But up until age 40, even, even 50, there is very, very little difference in muscle growth rates. Some research looks at 90-year-olds and compares to 20-year-olds. And if you look at the percentage gain of muscle mass, at least during the first eight weeks, 12 weeks of a program, mm -hmm. it's actually the same. There's no significant difference yet. No. So your total maximum potential of what, how much muscle you can hold on to it's most likely going to be less when you're 90 compared to when you're 20. Right. But if you're, as a 90 year old, when you start lifting, you'll make gains like a new lifter, pretty much. Mm. I mean, you have a very poor baseline at that point, probably, but you can still make very big changes to your body. And energy expenditure, there was a recent study that showed it doesn't really decrease if you maintain your muscle mass until, say, 65 plus. So that, that I think is one of the, the big things where a lot of people these days, think, you know, they turned the, 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 big, the big free, the free O, 30 or 40. Uh, physiologically speaking, those numbers, they don't mean jack. It, it really is, you know, um, your lifestyle changes. That, that has certainly big implications. How you think about things, how you train, those things may change. But what your body is capable of, it has not really decreased yet. I'm sure that's good news for a lot of people. <laughs> well, Mano, this is great. Um, I appreciate all the knowledge you dropped on us today. Where's the best place for people to find you? Sure. If you're, if you're new to my work, then probably the best way is if you go to mentalhandsomals.com on the top, uh, or immediately on your screen, you'll see a sign up button for my newsletter. And if you sign up there as a new member, you get a tour of my most popular contents. So the things that help people the most things that became more, most popular on social media, you get 14 free lessons. And that's, a, I think, a great way to get in touch with um, all the work I do. Okay. Yeah, there and obviously Instagram. And you can check out his book, The Science of Self-Control. Mm -hmm. And I'll put some links in the show notes for that. So, Menno, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show. And thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine. And I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.